This is Steve Zeltzer with Workweek Radio, and I'm with Al Rojas. Uh, Al Rojas is with the LACLA Labor Council for Latin American Advancement in Sacramento. He is also one of the founders of the United Farm Workers, and he was recently invited to participate in the founding convention of a new agriculture workers union in Mexico. And they had a convention this past weekend in uh, Tijuana, California, and it was a quite an important convention of agriculture workers in Mexico. So, Al, uh, thanks for joining us. And why don't you talk about your visit to Mexico, what led up to this <clears throat> convention, and what happened there? Well, first of all, Steve, it, uh, it was a historic event, uh, something that hasn't happened in Mexico ever as it relates to an agricultural workers union, national union, coming out of the whole issue of the workers' demands uh, back this early part of this year, of 2015, March 17th, where the workers decided enough was enough. Ya basta. Um, we are not going to tolerate the inhumane slave-like conditions of being treated less than, you know, uh, an animal, you know, and even an animal, animal shouldn't be treated or mistreated. But yet their demands were, we want to, we demand a decent wage, decent living. We demand health care benefits for our families, especially uh, women who are having babies. We also demand the whole question of the use of an application of dangerous carcinogenic uh, lethal um, uh, chemicals that are being applied and also um, injected into the soil, especially and, the strawberry fields. And those are illegal in, in the United States, so they, they send them to Mexico? Is that, that what, ha what well, happens? Well, uh, take the example of the Disco Corporation, how much power they have in California. The whole question of methyl bromide. Methyl bromide basically was outlawed in California, with the exception of a waiver that Mr. Uh, Driscoll, uh, Miles Ryder, Joseph Miles Ryder, who lives here in the Bay Area, uh, who is the uh, chairperson of the Driscoll Corporation, uh, was able to get a waiver, special waiver, for the strawberry industry, of the entire agricultural uh, industry, just the strawberry industry, and they can use, and they're allowed to be using, this very moment, those dangerous carcinogenic poisons. Now, remember, most of these uh, areas of, you know, strawberry growing uh, uh, are right alongside urban areas, such as Salinas, Watsonville, and Santa Maria, and Oxnard, uh, let alone, you know, maybe in San Quintin, where only farm workers are affected. But here we're having people who live in cities who are not farm workers, but also affected of the dangerous application of these poisons. Those are the conditions that they have. Plus the Mexican federal government's reluctance to enforce the contributions on the part of those employers in that region in San Quintin, Baja California, which was one of the demands that, that the uh, federal government was lax intentionally because there's somewhat of where, where are all these contributions going to and who's expended them and where, and where are the books that reflect who was contributing what. And that was one of the demands because there were many of those farm workers wives that were pregnant and when they went to get well when they were being told that they had you know those benefits the hospital in Tijuana uh, or in Senada which had to travel two and a half hours or five hours to get to a hospital there are no major hospitals in San Quintin with well over a hundred thousand men human beings and women and children in that region now this strike that you are involved in and were involved in of 80,000 workers and their families uh, against the growers, against Driscoll. That was a, a part of the, probably the largest strike in Mexico. And these workers are supplying a large amount of product, uh, food products, uh, to people in the United States and around the world. Uh, yet, uh, would you think that that played a part in the formation of this national union? I believe so. I think that uh, the mere fact that uh, I, it awakened many people in Mexico, but also here in this country and throughout the world. Because there's nothing new about what's happening in San Quintin versus other countries. You know, maybe South and Central America and the Caribbean nations and many other countries. But since this happens to be so close to the United States that we become like the um, backyard 
of where all the dumping of all the trash from U.S. corporations comes to be and the continuation of outsourcing workers in this country with cheap labor, but also this whole question of uh, inhumane conditions of uh, morality of, of these corporations having to think that they can exploit these people for the benefit of U.S. consumers, unknowingly to themselves, uh, not knowing what they're consuming. For workers who touch these berries and agricultural products with their hands and they breathe on them. And for an instance, if they have pneumonia or they're sick, and the whole case is why, why do they go to work sick, someone would ask, when they should be home. Well, if they go to don't show up for work in San Quintin, those employers fire you and will not take you back after you've been off for one day or two days or three days, much less five days. Now, what happened at this convention, and how many people were at the convention? How many workers were at the convention? Pretty close to 400 delegates, 375, 360, uh, which was very, very impressive to me. Uh, more impressive were and how they came. Some of them came in buses. Some came in their own cars. Maybe one or two flew, maybe. But the ones in San Quintin traveled five and a half to six hours. They left their homes at 12, 30, 1 o'clock in the morning. They traveled in these old 1950s <laughs> uh, buses, you know. Uh, and there's no heat in those buses. And they brought the bankers with them and their pillows and their food, whatever they could you know, carry with them, coming to a convention, okay? A convention about them about building a national union coming to be. And workers from Aguascalientes in Mexico, Central Mexico, and of course from the federal district in Mexico, which is a large district, and agricultural workers there too. So when they, when they arrive, some of them didn't have any money. Some couldn't even afford to buy breakfast. And some were in this horrible, you know, I mean, it's cold, freezing uh, weather. And here they are, you know, bundled up in those buses. It was until maybe a, the sun comes up that they feel like, wow, we get some heat. But it was very, very, uh, to me, uh, had a very strong impact about sacrifice and reminded me about, about back in the days of 1965 when we had no money. Uh, Whatever we had was donated, you know. Same thing here, you know. Uh, they had a kitchen, but the kitchen came with, you know, people volunteering beans, rice, you know, uh, corn tortillas, whatever people, you know, could get other people to donate to help feed. It was all communal, very, you know, uh, community-minded. And everything they, you know, put together, the meeting was held, in the National Telephone Workers Union, which belongs to the United uh, uh, Federation of uh, uh, Unions in Mexico, La UNETE, Unión de Trabajadores Nacional. Uh, so there were many other unions that also were invited, but uh, for the workers that came, uh, women and men, a lot of men, of course, and young, very young, some older people, you know, men, and some women and their wives, you know, uh, most most of them dressed in their traditional triki, triki, you know, dress and custom and traditions, you know. Uh, it was very, you know, worker -led. And of course, the union has always pushed that. This and wasn't the, a business union meeting. No, 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 this was not a business <laughs> union. Uh, what they did realize that, and the, and the whole issue is that in order to justify the legitimacy of a union, they had to go through this whole process and procedure of, um, how would I say, um, uh, establishing uh, the foundation of the union through its principles of articles of incorporation and also its constitution and also its process and procedure of uh, constituting the election and the delegates having voted for their delegates, the unions in Aguas Calientes and also Federal District and also in San Quintin. So these um, people who showed up as delegates were elected by uh, their rank-and-file workers who 
from, were from their own origin or their own uh, unions. So by the time they got there, then they had to go through the process of electing their committees and also their executive board. And to me, it was very kind of like moving because I could see the evolution of the growth. Um, it was kind of like, I mean, really powerful <laughs> because I'm sitting there saying, whoa, what was um, San Quintin and the voceros or the leaders that were the most prominent, you know, 13 of them, uh, all of a sudden began to kind of like blend in with now a, a new transition. And that transition went into where all of a sudden these younger people are coming in, obviously blending in with, you know, other age groups. But all of a sudden it just wasn't San Quintin any longer. Now is the new element coming in and a rank and file, which the law requires that they actually come from the fields. In this case, they are cultural workers. You cannot be a member or a union or a delegate or any leadership capacity if you're not an actual worker who came from the fields, agricultural fields, and are, was a farm worker from the rank and file. So this uh, democratic process that the workers had, um, it seems like it's quite different in the United States, the experience with the United Farm Workers, where they don't have a locals and the, the workers uh, on the fields are really not in the leadership of the, of the union. Yeah. Is that is that true? Well, you know, all this reflected when I was sitting there, to the whole dream of us, you know, who were all organizers. Chavez was an organizer. Huerta was an organizer. Uh, we hadn't worked in the fields for many, many years. We didn't come from any of the ranches. Not Larry, not uh, Leon, not Gilbert Padilla, none of them. None of us came from the fields. Uh, you know, we were professional organizers, one would say, or organizers. Um, we assumed positions that we shouldn't have. We, when we knew all along that the whole question of building leadership and, and emerging leadership uh, was taking those tasks of ranch committees and ranch committee, you know, presidents and secretaries from the ranches were, the, were really the delegates and the leadership of the union who should have taken over in the first constitutional union uh, convention of the United Farm Workers Union. You know, looking back at what transpired in, in San Quintin, uh, I'm only using that only as a basis of do we really have a you know, rank and file led union today? I think not. And I think uh, uh, the mere fact of where we're at today, you know, I'm very critical uh, because I think that we, uh, I say, I include myself, you know, uh, we erred, but we knew it all, we had talked about it that eventually the farm workers that themselves from the rank and file would take over the union's leadership, which should have been the case and was not the case. Chavez continued to, you know, hold power, and so did the individuals who did, did not have a right to that power. That would be Marshall Gans and uh, Mr. Scheinbaum from, I think his name was, uh, from New York, who was a boycotter, and many of the other people who were on, on the board. Yes, the, you know, they were, you know, leaders, and they led the union, they sacrificed, or we sacrificed, but in order to make this union be what it should be and continue on, the leadership would have to come from the rank and file, and that was not the case, and it isn't the case today. When you have the president of the now union, uh, of the United Farm Workers Union, has never worked in the fields before, never came from the rank and file. As soon as he graduated out of Michigan State University, he was a volunteer boycotter, uh, maybe Saturdays and Sundays in, in Wisconsin or Michigan, Michigan. Then all of a sudden he comes to California and becomes a staffer and a staff volunteer. Well, he has a good heart and he believes in you know, the union, no, nothing wrong with that. But when he assumes a role that belongs to the rank and file worker that comes from their cultural fields, he's in complete error. And he should have recognized that, being that, aside from, you know, it's common sense, you know, this is not your role. You should step aside and really allow that emerging leadership. But when we've had leadership that has tried to emerge, it was really squashed. It was uh, 
in most cases was uh, banished from the Union or fired from the Union or reluctant in recognizing the, um, the demands of the workers so that the workers would take lead in their union. You have, yes, you have workers now, but uh, I think one-third of them, or maybe a little less than one-third, are guest workers that now belong to the union here. Well, how do you build a strong union when you have six-month contracts with uh, guest workers out of Washington State and Oregon State who are members of the Uniform Workers Union, and there's no organizing, but they're shipped back and forth? So what do we have? A president for life and a board for life? Well, this, this guest worker program, uh, so-called immigration reform, that was submitted to Congress and backed by the AFL-CIO and the United Farm Workers and FLOC, uh, two farm worker organizations, included a clause that allowed for the unions to set up offices in Mexico and recruit workers to go as uh, guest workers to farms in the United States. What would that mean in relationship to this new union, since this union is actually representing agriculture workers in Mexico? Well, uh, that was a reflection when I was there this last uh, Saturday in Tijuana, and I'm seeing this happen. And we in the leadership there, and at least the leadership back before this uh, uh, constitutional uh, uh, convention, talked about the guest worker program and how it's being utilized at this very moment, where they were using it uh, as it relates to guest worker program being manipulated by the Driscoll Corporation with Mexican corporations that were on strike uh, to be able to use it as a uh, leverage against workers that if you don't go along with, you know, with the company and the corporation, we will not give you a, a, a permit or, or a letter of authorizing you to, to uh, travel as a guest worker to Mexico, to California. And so by using that, uh, would mean that if you're a bad guy or you're not in, in good faith with us in our, in our eyes, then we will discriminate against you and keep you from having to benefit from something that obviously is not to be used by as a strike-breaking uh, means. But uh, So you're saying that the Driscoll Corporation is actually using U.S. immigration law uh, in Mexico to bribe or coerce workers not to get involved in the union and not to really support strong unions in, in Mexico. Is that what you're saying? Based so far in the you know, testimony and the uh, workers that we've talked to in Mexico and uh, the workers in Mexico talked to their union leaders uh, in Baja California and San Quintín, yes. And what does that mean about the role of the United States the Obama administration and Governor Brown, who has this guy Ryder on, a, on the Agriculture Board in California. Are they colluding with this union busting going on in Mexico in, in San Quintin? Well, they're uh, a, always a, a party in crime, okay? They're basically complicit with having to allow and permit and knowingly that this is going on when they're looking the other way. And what does this mean and why are they doing this? Well, obviously... Agriculture in California is the number one industry in California, in the world, too, as it relates to at least California being the seventh largest economy in the, in the, in the world as a nation, okay? So basically, California could be considered a nation at, at the economic level in relates to agriculture and what it does to the state of California. But the question is, where is the merit of the workers who made California in agriculture, the power that they are economically, that they have now exploited so much in, uh, in relationship to the amount of uh, enormous wealth. So the political uh, parties in play, Republicans and Democrats, now have taken to become, uh, uh, how would I say, uh, a part of the political process. It's money, and the money that they need for political uh, campaigns such as the presidency uh, this coming uh, year. So what does that mean? Well, everything's at play, everything's at stake. So if you don't look like a Democrat, well, you better start looking and behaving like a Democrat, I mean, like a Republican, uh, because that's the name of the game. But it's not so much party affiliation, it's corporations. Now you've got to look like a corporation. 
and talk like a corporation, behave like a corporation, and concede to a corporate policy. And that's what the unions have done today. They bend over now and and uh, giving away a lot of the, the benefits. When you have the president of the AFL-CIO, you know, who uh, went along with the guest worker program back with the Senate version of uh, S744, the Comprehensive Immigration Reform, many of the unions who are leading to this day this immigration uh, reform, com comprehensive, uh, still support to this day uh, this whole question of uh, border militarization and also a, a permit for a legalization, they call, but it's not legalization. Basically, you're only being given permission to stay here uh, several months or maybe a year or two, and maybe they can, you know, uh, extend this stay, but you don't get what you call a green card, per se, uh, legalization. There's hoops and regulations that you have to comply with. If not, you, you are then put into an undocumented status, meaning you're deportable. That's the legislation in this S-744, which was passed by the Senate sitting in the Congress today, which is what Obama has been pushing all along, and the Republicans want more. They want the guest worker program into no longer uh, just the agriculture. They're now expanded in the you know, immigration reform into the service industry in this country. What does that mean? Well, you know, for the SEIU unions, it would mean janitors, it would mean uh, workers that clean buildings, it would mean hospitals. It would mean even the private sector, yes, but more so the public sector. Public sector would have to, you know, subcontract in order to, for them to legally go in and to, you know, bring in guest workers to, to replace workers, which is the case of what's happening now with the guest worker program in regards to where I just spoke about the manipulation of this guest worker program that's being used to break the strike. Now, uh, thousands of these workers are coming in to replace undocumented workers in the uh, Oxnard Coastal, Santa Maria Coastal, and Watsonville Coastal, and Salinas Coastal areas. And they're doing it all over the country. And I believe there's more than 500,000 guest workers already in this country. Now, the workers in Mexico, agricultural workers, they're actually working for uh, growers who supply uh, uh, product, agricultural products, to U.S. corporations. There are workers here that work uh, in agriculture who work for the same corporations. Uh, why uh, and how can they be brought together so they fight in a united front uh, against these same corporations or the same multinationals? Well, I think, you know, again, I go back to uh, this historical moment that I think the labor movement in this country is failing to see the real picture and real importance of what's happening there. Because, see, the same workers that are there in San Quintin, just five hours from the Mexican border, and the continuation of migration coming to that region, and some attempting to still cross the border, and some are crossing the border. Same workers there, same families there, same families in Washington, where you have the Sakuma workers, who already ran into that idea, that whole question of replacement and outsourcing in their strike with the Familias Unidas uh, who are, you know, conducted this uh, first boycott of Dresco back in, you know, two, almost three years ago. And here they were, uh, the, the grower there applied for guest workers, 400 guest workers, because they went on strike and uh, all of a sudden they're being replaced. So here's the government program by Homeland Security. The U.S. government is supplying guest workers to, to this grower because the grower apparently has some political leverage with money. So it goes back to that with regards to Obama, in regards to uh, Governor Brown, with has done nothing. And even though I don't believe that you organize by uh, uh, implementing laws to organize with, you organize workers by going directly to the workers and going over to where they reside and where they work and, and, and meet them at a one-on-one -on -one basis. Workers organize workers. Laws do not organize workers. Now, the situation in, in Mexico during the strike uh, in, in Baja, the, the police were calling there was repression against them. In Mexico, there, there are drug wars. There's militarization of not only the border, but the whole country. Did, did the workers there talk about 
the whole situation in Mexico as a whole, what's happening there in the country. Well, specifically in Zanquintin? Or the conference that was held. <clears throat> I mean, it's, there's a social, economic, political crisis. I mean, it's, it seems like it's a very explosive situation in Mexico as far as human rights, labor rights. I mean... Well, they did touch very much so on the solidarity of the, as an example, the 43 missing students. They talked about that. They talked about... Why, why don't you yeah. talk about the, the 43 students and what relationship that has to uh, the people of Mexico and, and, and the workers who talked about this? Well, it's interesting because the normalista schools, which is normal, normal schools, rural schools, was basically established out of the Mexican Revolution and was never really implemented. It's a part of, uh, I would say, the Plan Ayala, Plan de Ayala, which Emiliano Zapata wanted to implement. And with that was a small component that relates to how do we keep our young people in their cultural areas and zones in rural Mexico to continue on and with the hopes of new technology that we have people, young people, stay instead of leaving to the big city, such as Mexico City, and abandoning agriculture, and abandoning even worse than that by moving north across the border of the U.S. Uh, and the principles of the revolution back then somewhat went down the twos, but it wasn't until 1938 um, when Lázaro Cárdenas, who was the one who nationalized the oil, uh, in Mexico to buying out the Shell and Mobile and all the major uh, oil corporations out of Mexico. Uh, what what happens is that they, uh, they uh, began to uh, go back to this whole question of agriculture and also re it even more because much more in the years to come will be, you know, a more and more a greater population. So they established the, what do you call, the normalista schools uh, where working poor farm workers, sons and daughters, could go to these colleges to begin to train to go into the learned field of teaching and teaching the whole question of agronomy and also the new methodologies of, of uh, agriculture. Meaning, you know, I was looking at in that time the whole question of the revolution coming with regards to this, what we're living today is the genetically modified uh, uh, food industry and the whole question of uh, pesticides and fertilizers that were, you know, acute to very hazardous, you know, health uh, issues that were going to come and compound not only the human being person himself uh, working the fields but also people who are eating the very products but also the, the soil and the land and the water and the air that to them meant that you know especially indigenous people who believe very much in protecting the, the, the soil and the land as mother earth so and when they instituted these they start off with a budget uh, from the federal government so that they can continue to grow but as they began to see uh, that there was more and more of a demand from the rural areas and also beginning uh, to educate young men and women to be able to think and to be able to ask questions and question government's policies. Then it became a very sensitive situation for the government saying, uh oh, they're not learning too much. And by learning too much, they're questioning too much. And now they're beginning to demand and make demands, such as more money. In other words, building a true university uh, as it relates to UNA, maybe, in Mexico City. And, and in one state, have enough uh, room to accommodate, you know, the agriculture and other classes that relate to the learned field. And not just, you know, agriculture, even though agriculture was primary in the rural zones. But the issue comes to, obviously, uh, in the end, after we have, in 19, 
uh, what is it, 1970s, early 70s, about 73, 74, the emergence of uh, several uh, guerrilla leaders who turned to guerrilla warfare, uh, who were actual teachers from Ayotzinapa. And that was uh, Lucio Cabañas and uh, Genaro Vasquez Rojas, okay, who were, led a movement, a peasant movement, of the poor people's peasant movement in Mexico. And that was because of the things that I just spoke earlier that relates to the demands that there's something really lacking in the rural communities. And that's, you know, the infrastructure of the social dynamics in the, those uh, communities where lack of water, potable water, electricity, roads, housing, education, and schoolhouses, and books, and uh, additional supplies. These are the poorest of the poor, the most extreme poverty that one can think of, living in uh, homes of branches. Mm -hmm. Or a schoolhouse was open air, and whenever they wanted to continue their classes, they somehow brought out some canvas material so that all these little children would be huddled in this you know, makeshift little school. Horrendously, to this day, that exists today. And we're living in the 21st century with the North American free trader was promising a new change in this whole 2001, uh, 2000, you know, new century. Well, Clinton said that that would help Mexico, the people of Mexico. Well, when they were selling NAFTA, it was going to be to the betterment of the people of Mexico. You're well, saying that the, that hasn't happened. No, I think <laughs> it, as we well know it here with the uh, last couple of years in Occupy Movement, it's that 1%, you know, obviously. And the 99% who at the bottom level getting hit hard by these so-called economic liberalism uh, policies that we've enacted and we follow through. Even the Democrats have fallen through with that also and gone along with it and supported, you know, this whole question. Now, you know, we, we spoke earlier, you spoke about the TPP, Trans-Pacific Partnership, you know, which is going to have devastating effect, you know, already. Because already, uh, I think in... Uh, China, we heard uh, a representative who came here and was here and talked to us about w what devastation they could cause to the strawberry industry of their own industry, of the smaller growers, not major huge growers, but smaller growers in Japan. And so they're worried about the TPP as many people in the third world, where they're going to be uh, exacerbated and raped for uh, the kinds of policies coming down. Well, one of the uh, effects of, of NAFTA as far as the Constitution of Mexico was to change the Constitution and allow multinationals, big business, to buy the land that the uh, indigenous people lived on, the ajitos, mm -hmm. the, the agricultural land. And has this led to a radical change in, in Mexico as far as the development, the agriculture development, the land development in Mexico? You know, Steve, when we went uh, back in 1982, we were, I and 60 members of the International Longshoremen's Union, David Ari, took it upon himself to take a delegation down because the ILW workers were affiliated, were, you know, the dock workers were affiliated to ILW in the Pacific, in New York, and also on the Atlantic Coast, I believe, and in New Orleans, were being hit hard with uh, this whole question of... Um, uh, you know, there's uh, the trade deals and how it was affecting, you know, this whole question of uh, their workers uh, and also the union contracts. So he went down because the Longshoremen's Union in Mexico, they, they had contact with, wanted them to come and join and see and observe the elections. And even then, when we talked to workers and we were beginning now to get information on these secret deals, supposedly of the North American Free Trade Agreement. And what happens is that, uh, you know, I predicted uh, that we weren't talking about a million or two million. We were talking about 10 to 20 million. And that ended up being the case, where that whole question of uh, this North American Free Trade Agreement on this specific constitutional uh, amendment and elimination, I'd say, uh, the Article 27 of the agrarian reform in Mexico was completely eliminated, making it to where now these, uh, what do you say, um, 
cooperative land uh, hedo system and now became private. So they now the 10 or 12 or 15 acres or 20 acres that they had plans of plot became their their property, personal property, meaning that they could now sell it if they needed to sell it. And of course, with uh, the corn industry being uh, opened up from the Midwest, which is subsidized by, you know, our tax dollars to fluctuate the market, all of a sudden with their technology having uh, changed the whole dynamics of the genetic uh, corn into modified corn, who now uh, the corn kernel itself makes its own chemical to keep pests from having to eat it, okay? So now they're dealing with uh, volumes, you know, high volumes per acre. So they're now able to more than compete with the Mexican farmers by selling cheap cheap corn, uh, bio, you know, uh, modified uh, uh, corn in Mexico to the industry, you know, for corn flakes and cornmeal and all these other products that were used for, uh, you know, people to consume. So... What that does is it drives the market on the corn growers in Mexico devastating and uh, the workers losing their land, not being able to sell their corn, being able to compete with the American Midwest farmers. So many of them sold their land, or uh, some just gave up and just left the land and came north in the tens of millions uh, to this country. So who benefited? Uh, Mexico now imports a tremendous amount of produce from California and at the same cost of what's happening here. So who's eating this? Only the very wealthy and maybe some small farmers that sell in the marketplace. But now you have the U.S. <laughs> corporations such as Walmarts, Costco, Sam's Clubs monopolizing the entire uh, issue of commerce in Mexico. They control... 67% of commerce in Mexico, and especially in Mexico City, where Mexico now has each of those corporations that I mentioned, well over 3,000 uh, Walmarts in the country, n not negating uh, you know, the Costco's and the Sam's Clubs. Cause so is this a colonization of, of Mexico? I mean, basically... I, you know, it is. It is. Uh, basically, it's... Uh, uh, when you have the United States government, uh, who now sits on Reforma in a building with 6,000, 7,000 uh, ex-military or military uh, and national security officers from the U.S. government there, uh, such as the NSA, FBI, CIA, and also the U.S. military, uh, Marines, uh, they're there. And now they just recently passed a law, a Mexican law, that they have a right to carry arms, assault weapons, and military. So we know that they're being uh, uh, they're training a lot of their high, you know, command level military officers at the um, School of the Americas. And they're being trained in this whole question of what's happening or happening in Central America and also, you know, so on. In South America. Now, the murder of these students, uh, this was a political school, apparently, and uh, they the, they say that the drug dealers did it, but what, what was really going on with, with that murder of, of 43 students in, well, in Mexico? I mentioned that the school was basically a college, and the students were getting, again, short shortchanged. <laughs> they have barracks, they sleep on the floor. They don't even have a mattress. They basically use a cardboard, you know, cardboard. This is a college. A college, in, 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 cardboard. In, in and not even a bed, you know, with a mattress. But cardboard, and they bring their own blankets and soften the, the cement, you know, with a couple of blankets to, to sleep there. Uh, uh, they, they used to have a kitchen, somewhat of a kitchen, being supplied with their budget. And, you know, the only kitchen that they had to supply themselves with any food was the gardens that they were growing food and were able to, you know, somewhat process and save the food and then maybe some cattle. But they didn't have what you call uh, truly funded, budgeted, you know, financial, um, you know, budget where uh, they can really expand and, and grow, you know. 
uh, the college itself, it, there was a, a political, it had a history of politics just because of the nature of the U.S. government, uh, the federal government, uh, uh, minimizing year by year less and less other funding, cutting it back to where it, it was very difficult for them to continue to maintain day to day. What happened with Ayotzinapa and the 43 students, and there were maybe a little bit more than uh, 54, 60, uh, that uh, ventured on this whole question of um, uh, October the 2nd, Mexico City is the day of remem remembrance of the, uh, the what we call the, the Tatoloco in 1968, the students that were murdered when they pro protest in the government for the same issues of the, uh, today, same issues. A corrupt dictatorship, government, criminal, assassin government back then that dealt with, you know, an iron fist with the bullet and the gun, the gun and the disappearance. You know, they disappear you uh, for having to, you know, talk against the government. That day, on October, the, prior to October the 2nd, they had planned to go to Mexico City. So they went around begging. Uh, after they got an agreement from the bus drivers, would you, could we use your buses if providing we got your diesel? And he agreed. He said, just don't do anything to my buses. I'm going to take you uh, to Mexico City to this protest. And you guys pay, you know, and collect money for a diesel. I'll take them. Well, what happens is that in the same time, you have this uh, mayor, uh, PRD mayor, allegedly, who had already had, you know, a real trail about involvement with the narco trade. And most politicians in Mexico were bought off because of this, you know, big money in, in drugs and being a party to as government officials that you allow them to get away with, uh, you know, or controlling authority and being able to bribe the police force or state police force. So, you know, everybody's doing well because the narcos are controlled. So this mayor, uh, is then known to have shot and killed, you know, several of his opponents, point blank, okay? And also having uh, somewhat established and allowed and permitted uh, somewhat of a, what we call, uh, drug gang uh, of police officers. During the day, the police officers were uniforms. At night, they became these, uh, what do we call, uh, drug uh uh, fear, uh, instilling fear in the community. So what they're doing is having a celebration or a uh, announcement by the mayor's wife, outgoing mayor, uh, anointing his wife to become the next mayor, okay? Literally. So they, they're they on their way and have to go through Iguala. Iguala is when they were having their uh, setting for this celebration or this you know, election of, of appointment or anointment of this uh, woman who was going to take over her husband's position uh, in government. In other words, keep the, the drug lords happy with the control of their politics with all the money they got to buy the election. So they got a, they had to go through Iguala, to the center of town, practically, to get the main highway. So what happened was they found out the police, you know, the, the mayor, found out by word of mouth that they were coming to kind of disrupt them. And that was not the case. They were going basically because they were going around begging for money for diesel at the bus stations and all over and people in the parks and all over you know, to do this for several days. So uh, they thought they were out camping. Let's do a protest. We're going to do this kind of thing. But basically they, would, they had to come an hour, I think a little over an hour, from uh, Ayotzinapa in their buses uh, to, to get over to get the main highway to Mexico City, which is about three hours, three and a half hours from uh, Iguala. So they didn't get far. They found them and they, uh, what do you call it, uh, they, uh, they they boxed them in, you know. I forget the word for it, but they, they boxed them. Blockaded them. them and, uh, they blockaded them. And they closed them in. They couldn't get out the buses. And they didn't even allow them to get off the bus or they questioned them, where are you going? Uh, they weren't armed. 
There were other members and civilians who were on there, except these students. So the military and police was there, and some members of the military, and all the uh, city police were there from Iguala. And they started shooting at them, and whereas they were trying to put the fear of God in them. And some of them have indicated that they, they were told, we came to kill you, okay? Because we know what you're going to do. So uh, bottom line is they shot and killed a couple of them. And there's videotape where they're asking them, please, we're not armed. You know, why are you shooting at us? You know, there's videotape of us. But they wouldn't stop. So some of them got away, but they corralled the others. And that went on all night almost into the wee hours of the shootout, shootout. And then finally, eventually, they, they got them the night, you know, at night and gathered them all, 43, and they put them in vans and trucks, whatever they could carry them. And instead of taking them to jail, they took them straight into the mountains and into the jungles of Guerrero. And that was the last time they were found, uh, seen to be heading out, you know, out of town. Because if you're police, well, the requirement was to take them to jail and keep them there. Uh, so that justice could prevail. But in this case, that wasn't the case. Their whole intention was to kill them. And, of course, the families maintain that they're still alive. And the reason for that, I think, is that there's hope, right? And there's hope that they're, they're alive. Um, but in most cases, many people believe that chances are slim because uh, the government's already come in, federal government with this sleaze-type, very poor, inadequate unprofessional investigation with a lot of holes in their investigation after an independent group came in from outside of the country and says there's no way they could have burned 43 bodies in less than seven hours with, you know, uh, rubber tires and and uh, wood uh, and logs and diesel. There's no way they could have burned them. With the, they had, would have had to have intense heat, intense heat of two to 3,000 uh, degrees heat. And there's no way that you're going to get that kind of heat out of uh, rubber tires and logs and branches. So this whole question of uh, uh, body remains and teeth and this, well, there's some, some, some bones that were found there were from animals, okay, where they had maybe barbecued or they killed some animals and they burned them there. But... Um, uh, it, it was disproven that the facts that they had submitted to the federal uh, attorney general's office were inconclusive and had no real findings of any genetic uh, or DNA that pointed to any of the students, even though they claimed that one of them uh, did show uh, those signs. But uh, where is it at now? Enormous worldwide uh, uh, knowledge about this situation, uh, about these students that were taken by uh, municipal police. And although they claim the federal government, we have 75 people arrested. Not one of them has been charged with anything at this point. And it looks like what they're going to do is because now the independent group has said there's no evidence. They're probably going to release them all. When it was them, the police, that actually kidnapped them. And if for sake of they kidnapped them, where are they would be sufficient to where they'd be charged with, at least right now, kidnapping, where someone will start to sing. You're going to spend the rest of your life in prison, even if you're 22 years old. But there's nothing of the sort. And you, the government has not released or allowed anybody to get close to them. It's almost like they may or not be in jail right now. They may be free. No one knows. But that's Mexican law. It's uh, what you call the lack of... Uh, uh, respect to the uh, rule of law, and that very prevalent in Mexico. In Mexico, they arrest you, throw you in jail, prove yourself that you're not guilty. That's how it works. There's no such thing as jury trial. There's only one Ministerio Público, one judge uh, that decides your fate based on whatever they bring forward, and most of it is circumstantial evidence, and most of the times you get convicted. There's a uh three protection contracts with the National CETAM, which is the Confederation of 
of uh, Mexican workers in Mexico. And you have uh, two other unions, the Chrome and the Croc, which are affiliated, who all of a sudden at the strike, during the strike in March 17th, they came up with this uh, growers. We already have contracts, basically, you know, uh, protection contracts in order to keep uh, th this 80,000, 60,000 workers from uh, taking this whole thing of uh, we represent these workers. All of a sudden, these people show up from nowhere, and the workers say, where in the hell did, where are you guys at? So you have that political problem because that, that's also connected with the PRI totally and controlled by the PRI because the PRI is the government today, has been prior to the action in the Conservative Action Party in the past several years. And prior to that, for 75 years, the PRI in control. So here we are now back with the PRI. So who's in the Labor, uh, you know, Secretary of Labor's office is the PRI. So you have those political ramifications there uh, relative to this, the protection unions uh, for these uh, growers in, in San Quintin. And that includes uh, supposedly Ryder, and company, uh, the Driscoll Corporation, Berry Mexican Company, and other Mexican uh, growers. So, uh, what does that mean to the this uh, Saturday's um, uh, new union that's now come up with uh, its own constitution now and submitting the paperwork to the labor uh, uh, department? Well, it's going to be a battle because uh, they don't want to see this. Because just imagine the impact it may have. If they do, you know, we, if the boycott is effective, which I think with time, it, once we reinforce it, it has a very good chance of, you know, putting some tremendous amount of, uh, you know, pressure. See, the periods of 1968 and the Great Boycott are totally different dynamics-wise as to social media. We never had the social media that we have today. Uh, very powerful. Even if it's Facebook, call it what you want, but millions of people see it instantly and continuously. When we had corporate media, you had to get arrested or have to, you know, beat you up so bad that the television cameras would take a picture of you. But on these issues of the labor movement, Hardy, but getting back to this whole question of uh, what we need to do, or what ne they need to do, is put pressure in Mexico as it relates to the demand that they legitimately allow them the registration of this new union. But what they're worried about the government, and going back to uh, the Driscoll Corporation, uh, Barry Mex and them, uh, having dumped the whole responsibility on the Mexican government, you settle the wage issue. And whatever you agree to, we employers, Mexican and U.S. corporations, we will abide by your uh, minimum wage uh, law and we'll pay that amount. Well, of course, that became uh, a bad move in a way because the the Alianza begins to think there's good faith with the government that they're going to put pressure on the employers on all these other benefits which they want, you know, health and welfare benefits, Social Security, and this uh, new wage increase, which are, they were demanding 300 pesos, which is most, almost like $17 a day, okay? okay. Considering that there's $15 uh, per hour fight in this country for restaurant workers, uh, you know, within hours from the Mexican U.S. border, uh, so they offer them at the end close to $12 a day. And even then, the uh, employers refuse, you know, to really recognize them as still as a union. They wanted them, you recognize the minimum wage set by the federal government, we'll pay that. Well, that's just like here in California. You have a minimum wage law, so what do the employers say? Well, if you don't believe I pay you minimum wage, go file a complaint with the labor commissioner's office and see where that takes you. But when it comes time to where you want to negotiate a wage to the much more than the minimum wage, such as what's happening with the uh, $15 campaign, what do you have now? Uh, Ms. Clinton, who's running for president, says, no, I support the $12.50, okay? Uh, not the $15. Whereas in Sacramento, you have the mayor there, we support the $12.15. What does this mean? And it's a resounding uh, uh, response from the Democratic, you know, party or uh, politicians that are saying, oh, we're, we're not going to go $15 campaign. So here you have SEIU spending 
tens of millions of dollars on this campaign. And in light of that, you have this dilemma. But going back to this whole question of what happens in Mexico with if this union comes to be, well, every every if they if they win this battle in San Quintin, to let's say three hundred pesos, seventeen dollars a day, and they're paying only seventy pesos, six and seven dollars a day, you can imagine what's going to be uh, in throughout the country in the demands. If they got it, we want it. So the union's going to. Uh, emerge, you know, with this tremendous headache of having workers demand them that they want to be in the same uh, boat. So the government is going to be pressured, you know, to try to quell this. And and they see that as a particular threat of what it's going to do to industry. Like here, too, with uh, the whole question of the $15 uh, an hour, we can't afford it in the restaurant business. But yet McDonald's and all these major corporations making tons of billions and billions of dollars. A profit, you know, and some of them worldwide, <laughs> you know. So, what are the implications here? Very big, because aside from that, if that happens, and the best thing that can happen, that that fight there transitions into this country. Workers in Mexico, workers here, same workers, and same, same aspirations for union. They cross the border. They trans transfer into a union here, their own union here. Nothing wrong with keep having another union come in, or many unions come in. The more unions, the better, okay? But this whole business about there can only be one union is a bunch of BS. There's no such way that one can say there's only going to be one union. There's a union up in Washington State, Familias Unidas. They should have a right to organize. There's one in Oregon State. They should have a right to organize, or several more, as the, in New York State or any other or in uh, Florida. Now, the last question: the uh, United Farm Workers and Flock uh, were aware of this convention. Did they help it or support it, or what was the relationship to this founding convention of the uh, the Farm Workers Union in Mexico, Agriculture Workers Union in Mexico? Well, I think that you know. As usual, the United Farm Workers Union, uh, wherever they're at in their head, uh, missed a great opportunity to be there at this very historic moment. It was a shame that they didn't even send their own solidarity message to them as a respect. They lost respect for them. Uh, what they lack is to understand that the United Farm Workers cannot dictate with 6,000 members to a potential of 80,000 workers and the will of those workers. That the workers are the one, and remember I say workers. I don't say staff people or non-farm workers. And I think what scares them is the, the, the when the, the workers there in Mexico are saying, we don't want any union to be beholden to any political party. Our union will remain independent from the worker and rank and file level to lead its own union. And we don't believe that there's any other way that we can establish the strength in the unions. The government came in and beat us to death, and they tried to kill us off and intimidate us. They failed when they, they allowed Barry Max and the Driscoll Corporation to heed them to come in with all the mighty force of the military and the police and state police to beat them down. They couldn't do it. So that's a strong message. But I would say that uh, the flock uh, Baltimore did send a message of solidarity. At least he did that. Uh, uh, he did mention, you know, which I found interesting. We're going to definitely follow up that they would support the boycott through the FLCIO and work to, you know, strengthening the boycott. Well, we're going to hold him to that. Okay, so that's <laughs> that's in writing, that, or that's in sound. In his, when he sent his uh, solidarity, the UFW. I think I know, or I assume, or I believe I know, why they hesitate in supporting the boycott. To this day, they have not supported the boycott, and there's reasons for that. They, when they opened up uh, guest worker offices in Michoacan, uh, working with the uh, criminal assassin political party there, PRI, the PAN, and the PRD, they're no different, okay, those political parties. And the fact that they want to uh, bring those workers in to replace and outsource workers as they're doing now with the old the 
now guest worker program throughout the coastal valleys, replacing undocumented workers, is, which is basically the intent of their having signed an agreement with the uh, Mexican state government, PRI government in Mexico. And I think they have also opened up office quietly in the state of Aguascalientes.